Well, keeping with our theme of uh, Pets Unleashed, uh, I'm not going to continue this week in our study from uh, the book of Exodus on the snapshots of a spiritual journey, but I, I want to talk a little bit about something that would be a little more appropriate uh, for all of us and kids in light of Vacation Bible School. And uh, our scripture reading is found in, in Luke 15. And uh, in Luke 15, Jesus tells us three stories to make one point. And I just want to go over those three stories kind of quickly. Uh, now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming nearer to listen to Jesus. It's amazing to me, the holiest person who ever walked on planet Earth, that those who were publicans and tax collectors, they were considered worse than sinners in the day. <laughs> and, and, but they're all attracted to Jesus. All the people, the, the, these tax collectors, these, the sinners, they're attracted to the holiest person on earth. So if we ever have a self-righteousness about ourselves that people don't like, we must not be very Jesus-like. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the... Uh, they were religious snobs of the day. They, they thought they were holier than everyone else. The Pharisees and the scribes, the scribes looked down on everyone else. Uh, they were kind of spiritual snobs too because they're the ones who could write the scriptures and others who couldn't write. Uh, they, they felt superior to them. The Pharisees and the, the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. The implication being, how in the world could he be a holy man if he associates himself with people who are not? And so Jesus told them three parables. The first one was the lost sheep. And in vacation Bible school yesterday, I did a drawing for the kids about the, the lost sheep. And so this is just a, kind of a rehearsal for them. It says, which one of you, having a hundred sheep, losing one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and he rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And then Jesus says to his audience, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. Well, that was a, quite a shot towards those self-righteous Pharisees and, you know, complaining about Jesus hanging out with the tax collectors and, and the sinners. Uh, uh, Jesus just gave a direct hit. I love what it says here. There is joy in heaven, not over the overly pious, but over someone who is the extreme opposite, but turns to the Lord. Turns to the Lord. First story, lost sheep. Second story is about a lost coin. He says, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search very carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors saying, Rejoice with me. I have found the coin that I have lost. Then Jesus makes the application to his audience. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I find it very curious here. In the situation of the lost sheep, he says there's joy in heaven. Now he refines where the joy is at. He says, when one person in need of repentance changes their heart and their mind towards Jesus, one who comes to the Lord, there is joy in the presence of the angels. Now most people think that the angels are rejoicing. But read this very carefully. It doesn't say the angels are rejoicing. 
No, no, no. The rejoicing is going on in the presence of the angels. Well, who is in the presence of the angels? God Almighty himself. Jesus is saying here, there's joy in heaven because when one lost coin, one lost sheep, when one lost person is found, God rejoices. He then tells a third story, third parable. He says, there was a man who had two sons. And he says, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give to me the share of the property that will belong to me. You know what he's really saying? He's saying, I want my inheritance. I want it now. So dad drop dead. That's what he's saying. I want what's going to be mine in the future. Problem is you're living too long. So drop dead, dad. I want it now. That's pretty rebellious if you ask me. He says, give what belongs to me. And he did. The father divides up the property between his son and he holds that in, the, in his inheritance, his eldest son, and he gives it his portion to the younger son. It says then that, that a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had, the inheritance, and he traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. He became a party animal. He gathered around a lot of friends. He was spinning it like there's no tomorrow. And he was living the high life, enjoying life, because he thought this is what it's all about. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country. And he began to be in need. So he went to a friend. And his friend hired him. One of the citizens that was in the country had sent him to this field to feed the pigs. Now, you've got to realize that this is a Jewish boy. And this young Jewish boy has raised his whole life that pigs are an unclean animal. And he is going to do the lowest, most despised, disgusting job that there possibly could be. My kids would think that's cleaning toilets. <laughs> Pretty close. But I think cleaning toilets was better in the Jewish mind than feeding the pigs. It's the only job he could find. Where were all his friends then that he wasted all of his money on? He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. That's a pretty rough rough place to be in. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But I am here dying of hunger. Sometimes we just have to hit rock bottom. You can't get any further down that all you can do is climb up. So here's what he says. I will get up and go to my father. Whoa. We call this repentance. It's turning around. It's going in the opposite direction. It's having a change of mind. And he said, I will say to my my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. We call this confession. When you admit what you have done is wrong. He makes confession. This is what I'll do. I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to confess. He's going to say, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. We call this humiliation. He humbles himself. He confesses his wrong. He's got great humility. He goes on and says, treat me like one of your hired hands. How humble. And so he set off to his father. But while he was still a far way off, his father saw him. Why? 
because his father was looking for him every day. When you're a parent, you never give up on your kids, right? This father hasn't given up. He saw him far way off. And his father saw him and he was filled with compassion. And he ran. If you have your Bible, you underline those words. He ran. This is probably the most notable feature of the whole thing to a Jewish listening audience. It was totally disrespectful for an elder to run. You sent your servants running. For you to run was like you were low class. You were, he throws all class, all of that out of the window. And he's saying this to this Pharisee group who is so superior. This man ran to his son. And he put his arms around him and he kissed him. And then the son who had rehearsed his speech he says, Father, I have sinned. Here's his confession. Sin means I've missed the mark. I didn't measure up. I'm a failure. I didn't do what was right. I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He's humbling himself before his father. But his father said to him, to his slaves, quickly bring out the best one the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and put sandals on his feet. This is called reconciliation. This is my son. And get the fatted calf and kill it. That's sacrifice. And, and let us eat and celebrate. This is restoration. He says, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost like the sheep, like the coin, and is found, and is found. And they began to celebrate. I want to stop the story right there. Three stories. I want to suggest the three stories are really about you, about me. Three stories. You are the lost sheep, the one lost sheep that he leaves the 90 and 9 to go looking for. You are the lost sheep. You are the lost coin. You are the lost coin that he sweeps and sweeps and looks for and wants to find. He's looking for you. You are the lost son who said, listen, I'm going to do my own thing. I can go my own way. I don't need you. I'm good enough. The point is, God is looking for you. God is looking for me. Will you say that with me? God is looking for me. Folks, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. Just as I am, I can be found. God is looking for me. Now, you may not know that you're a lost sheep. You might not know that you're a lost coin. You might not know that, know, know that you're a lost son. Most people don't know when they're lost. They don't. You're driving along, and all of a sudden your favorite tune comes on the radio, and you start singing that favorite tune. You drive right by the street you're meaning to take, and a little bit you say, oh, none of this looks familiar to me. Where in the world am I? I mean, you didn't intend to get lost. You just were caught up in something else, and all of a sudden you found yourself lost. People don't try to get lost. That just... They are lost. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the, the, the sheep that was lost, I can imagine the picture. Now, I'm not going to get down on my hands and knees, but just kind of grazing on the grass. Okay, and the shepherd and the other sheep, they, they, they go along, but man, oh, you see a nice juicy cluster of grass over there, and you're going you're to go get that. And, and oh, you see another one pretty soon. It's like Isaiah said, 
all we like sheep have gone astray. <laughs> We've turned everyone to his own way. And so I, I'm often, and, and I don't even realize, when all of a sudden I look around, where's everybody at? I'm lost. Why? Because I was just nibbling myself away. That's how some people, they find themselves lost. I mean, they didn't mean to run away from God. They just nibbled themselves away from God. Some people are like the coin. The coin was just misplaced. The, the coin wasn't going anywhere on its own. And so that coin got misplaced somewhere. And, and that's what happens. Sometimes we just feel misplaced. We look around and we see those who really know the Lord, have the love of God in their heart. I'm not talking about the hypocrites. I'm talking about the genuine Christian. You say, oh, well, I just don't fit in with them. I'm kind of a misfit, misplaced. I'm lost. I'm a lost coin. I'm not where I should be. And then there's the lost son. The lost son was rebelliously lost. He got lost because he just refused to do what the father had intended to be the best plan for his life, for him to wait for the inheritance. And he rebelliously wanted it right now. But you know, most people, they don't even know that they're lost. They don't. Now, next thing I gather from the stories is, it's always kind of scary when you find out you are lost. You know, kind of scary when you find out you are lost. Whoa. Where am I? Uh, this is not where I thought it was going to be. Especially a person in life. They meander through life, lost, and all of a sudden they say, I'm at this stage of my life and this is not where I intended to be. I think most people agree it's a little scary thing when all of a sudden you find out, I'm lost. I'm lost. Ask any child whose name is finally put over the intercom at the department store that they're lost. And they can't, or worse, at an amusement park. Uh, we got a lost child here, all right? They're a little scared and frightened. We're all frightened when we find out that we actually are lost. Here's the best part. It is so wonderful when you are found. It is so wonderful when you are found. And the passage said, spiritually speaking, when we repent and we come back to the Lord and we're found, that's what it's calling that, you're found. God rejoices over you. Isn't that wonderful? God rejoices over you. I want to suggest to you that you can be found today. It is so simple. You just say, Lord, I blew it. Here I am, I'm coming back. Just like that young son who blew it and came back and said, I blew it. I wasted everything. Just make me a hired hand. The father is so compassionate and gracious. He takes you into his arms. He doesn't just put a ring on your finger and a robe on your back. The Bible says he gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ and you're clothed in the love of God, and you are forever his child. You belong to him. And you're found. You're found. And that's what you can be today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for these three stories that tell us that you're looking for us. Lord, remove our stubborn hearts and so that we just say, here I am, Lord. I'm glad to be found. Perhaps someone right now will just say, Lord, find me. I confess. I need you. Find me. We know that you will. In Jesus' name, amen. We got our little granddaughter, Amelia, here today, and we play hide and seek. And we play hide and seek. She runs and hides, and I got to count. And when I get down to, ready or not, here I come, she jumps out and says, here I am. <laughs> she likes being found. She doesn't like the hiding part. She likes the being found part. And that's what I'm saying. 
you can be found today. We're going to sing a song, Jesus Loves Me.